You uh, cannot Hannah, say Hannah, I don't want to argue. I don't want You I, do want to argue. You wanted uh, to make your point, uh, so Hannah, let Hannah, me make it back. Hannah, Hannah, the, the, and then you're going to try to say it's too spicy for me. No, I got you. Like, let just, me respond to you. It is not capitalism coming in and enshrining enslavement. And in fact, capitalism is what got rid of it and started pushing back against the centuries old awful institution. So to say it's capitalism, I think it's honestly offensive. So a little while ago, Jubilee did a video about whether or not America would be better off under communism. It was quite an interesting conversation. Let's dive right into it. America would be a more powerful country under communism. May the rear step forward. I think it would be a lot better for all the people who are working jobs that are not, I guess, tech, basically. So I make content, which means that I work a lot of hours and I don't pay, pay the same amount as a soft dev. So I think it would create more creativity in certain like creative industries, artists. If you make a bigger pie, everyone gets a bigger slice. Yeah. <laughs> That's usually one of the main selling points of communism by communists, that if we finally reach their communist utopia, everyone would have all this leisure time to focus on art and philosophy. The issue is that your average person is just a follower, and they don't really have anything interesting to say, and they're not original or creative. This society does not need more artists, it needs better art. I think one of the main misconceptions about communism is that it's just making everybody equally poor. When Marx and Engels wrote repeatedly that the first step under communism is increasing the productive forces. In the US, over 80% of our population is living paycheck to paycheck. If you provide people's basic needs, if you invest in economic growth and in jobs and in infrastructure rather than investing in endless war and massacring Muslim people in Gaza, you're going to make this country a lot stronger. You're going to make the people a lot more stable here. See, now that was a decent criticism of American capitalism. Is communism the solution to this? Absolutely not. But he highlights some very important flaws with the American system, which we will come to see that the capitalists on the other side of the debate do not come to address in any sort of meaningful way. They really just point out the fact that communism is an objectively worse or untenable system. I grew up in, in a white ring area. Uh, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, I was born in Dallas, Texas. I'm the first American in my family. Everybody's from the Congo. If my family was able to come here, of course they would have some capitalist connection. So I grew up very much with the idea that everything I need is under capitalism. Individualism, freedom, all these things are under capitalism. But I'm black in America. So those contradictions really just create that friction where I'm like, this doesn't align with what I was told and what I'm actually seeing or actually feeling. Mm -hmm. So why did I come to communism? When I actually read it, when I went from, from Marx to Lenin, to, to Mao, to Deng, to, to Fred Hampton, I started realizing like, oh, this is patriotism. This is the idea that I look at another American and think to myself, I want you to be fed. I want you to feel fulfilled in your life. I want you to feel like you actually have control within your society. Honestly, as somebody, again, who grew up in that right-wing area, that flies over everybody's heads. Kind of sucks that this guy's parents came here just for him to hate white people. <laughs> Disagreeers are walking quick on this one. <laughs> can, I say, can I say something first on this one to be so uh, bold? Here's my argument. How come every communistic com country has to build a wall or a fence to keep people in? China ain't letting people out. My grandma, I remember going, my Trump grandma. Trump right Trump <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but where did you come? But, but, but where did you out. come? There's not a mass immigration into Venezuela, into China, into Russia. Where do people want to go? Switzerland, America, Sweden. They're all talking about, we need to build a wall because people are coming. China's not going. Well, we better build a wall because all those Americans are coming across. Nobody's going there. Uh, more like China wants to actively keep people out. And the Chinese people who you do see coming over here from China, you know, going to elite universities, come here because Chinese elite universities are so competitive. Or to exploit the U.S.'s resources in some other way, like buying real estate or buying up our farmland because of this free market attitude we have over here in the States. Or because they're Cantonese speakers rather than Mandarin and are just kind of annoyed because they're not top dogs in their own country. 
So you legally cannot become Chinese. I w went to international school growing up, and every single non-Asian or anyone else that's like American or Canadian that's gone to China has never wanted to come back to the U.S. That's something that's really interesting. So I think it's like if you've never been, it's an adverse selection. I, a group of people who well, are already. Let me finish your point, and yeah. then like, got you. I guess like whoever has the open mind to go visit usually doesn't want to come back. And I do live streaming, so I know a lot of live streamers who like permanently move over to the like Asia, especially China, because not just it's cheaper, it's also just higher benefits. Most people get like free healthcare,、um, so it's a lot easier for you to survive there. I think it's not because people don't want to go; it's also because you're taught propaganda since a young age. China's scary, China's bad, evil, red dragon. So people don't go and don't even go see it. That's the problem. I would definitely argue that a lot of China's success is due to the introduction of free markets. But if we want to run with this idea that China is a socialist country, which is just fundamentally untrue, I could also just point to the fact that they're super low on the HDI. Their GDP per capita is like twelve thousand dollars. The U.S. GDP per, per capita is seventy thousand dollars. So, like, I, I would say in terms of like economic success, we're definitely doing way better. So that guy just made the single strongest point against people who refer to themselves as communist and support. Current existing governments that identify themselves as communist, which is that China really is not a socialist state. China is not some dictatorship of the proletariat, and in China, there's very limited worker self-management. Right, workers have limited decision-making power and autonomy in the workplace. The Chinese government has also suppressed strikes and other labor movements, and there is also still significant income inequality. China is, in fact, a type of corporate state where the government has created these very strategic and effective state-created legal monopolies, which have brought in a ton of wealth. And also, what that guy neglected to bring up is purchasing power, which is what actually matters, and how Chinese wages have ballooned. Under Xi Jinping, Ty.、Um, in terms of how we see immigration into this country, of course, we're American. We're only going to see the American viewpoints of this. China has immigration. People do try to cross the China's border all the time. We're all humans. Everybody's doing the same thing around the world. I would say what you're seeing is a perspective issue. I would love to break it down even more and talk to you about the massive amounts of CIA missions that have gone through Latin America to destabilize those countries. But just at that point. To what you were saying, judging a country by how much the wealthiest people in their country profit in their company, we both know what GDP means. Of course, I, it's it's a bad、so、way to a, really explain your country. What about HDI? Human, Break down human, HDI. Human development.、Uh, uh, sorry, human development index. And how so does that it's、mean? measured by things like health, income. It's the UN standard for like how well an economy is doing. The U.S. and China are also not beginning from equal starting points either, which makes this kind of disingenuous. Like Western European countries, or、uh, countries that are like the colonial product of Western European countries, have had longer to industrialize. China went from basically a feudal society to an industrial society comparatively overnight. So the HDI of China does not necessarily reflect、uh, a defect of the Chinese system. Or of communism generally, and again, I don't even like communism. I don't think it's a good solution, but I can't help but feel this guy's making a bit of an apples to oranges comparison here.、Uh, so from that point, perfect healthcare. We rank 37 in the United States. Cuba、okay. ranks two.、Yeah. Sure. Oh God! Sure. Yeah. And you, and you, Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Hold Cuba on. ranks what? Cuba ranks what? Wait, I want to.、Yeah. I really want to engage. They've been number one and number two in the hover through those spots. According to Cuba, Cuba uses no, their doctors. The according, according to the Commonwealth, according to the Commonwealth, according to the Commonwealth. Wait, wait, wait. wait Cuba, been... Cuba is 83 on the HDI. They use their doctors like slaves because 90% of the profit goes to the state. They literally <laughs> traffic their doctors.、And、When doctors the first time Bush opened up a program to let Cuban doctors escape because they were trafficking them and making them go do these PR campaigns in other countries to give healthcare, seven thousand people immediately came to the U.S. At one、mm. meeting, two doctors passed. Notes to other doctors they were on a hospital set with and said, "Kidnapped." This so is this is propaganda. Emo- so I appreciate the emotional examples. 100%. It's not emotional. You can talk to the No Border Sovereignty Organization that Hannah, works to get healthcare professionals out of there. I'm trying to finish my point. You're like the、there. nicest person in this room. I, I would well, hope you let、I'm、me finish my point. Then they don't answer. But please、you. go. Well, the guy with the head wrap is such a jerk. But they are repeating Prager U tier propaganda about Cuba. Let's be honest. Well, I've been told that. 
Fear, 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 fear is happening in Cuba. They're doing this super, super, super scary thing with Cuba, which is great. I would love facts. So I'm giving you in, facts in terms about of the doctors H fleeing the country and also about how they're having how to ration basic to antibiotics in their Hannah, hospitals. Like yeah, we've got them under an embargo, they, not obviously. Since, that, no, wait, wait, medical things are excluded since 1992. That's not true. Wait, wait, that's been that disproven true. by multiple Eddie, studies. This year during COVID, Cuba made their own COVID vaccine because the the U.S. pharmaceutical company used intellectual property laws to prevent them from making this using our vaccine recipe. So they created their own, but they couldn't get syringes into the country because of the embargo. Because how are you supposed to get metal when you're on a they tiny island country and you're surrounded by the U.S. military? Eddie, I want and you can't get any questions. trade in I want to ask you a few questions. Eddie. How, how question, far back do you think the embargo <laughs> is affecting Cuba? How long back do I think the yeah. embargo like probably what, like since did... it's been put on? Oh, really? But so I think in, when we so look wait, at... No, no, no. Let me respond real quick, real quick. In 1960... The USSR became the largest trading partner with Cuba. They started paying buying more for Cuba's Cuba sugar. Yeah. They, they started buying all of Cuba's and sugars tobacco, and paying right. more than the United States was paying. Fidel Castro is on record saying that the embargo had no effect on Cuba at all. So we can presume that up until 1991, when the USSR collapsed, that it didn't have an effect. So to claim, Fidel was obviously posturing to make it seem like Cuba was coming from a place of strength. And imagine being naive enough to honestly believe that the U.S. isn't actively trying to undermine and destabilize a socialist country that's like right in its backyard. Come on. That the embargo is affecting effect Cuba. On and, I, effect on and I think when we look at the, this is the can I make a point? Because this is a point I've yeah, wanted to make for a long time. When, I, when we look at countries like Cuba and China, I think it's more important to judge them based on what they had before the revolution. Before sure. Cuba had a revolution, nobody had access to health care. They were working Wait. on slave plantations Wait, that Cuba were dominated by Western multinational corporations. China before the revolution, yes, there were famines during the era of Mao. There were far more famines before Mao came to power and before China was able to industrialize and get That's to the point today point. where they're now one of the most powerful countries on earth. In the 1950s, the U.S. was already industrialized. China had to do that. They were a semi-feudal country in extreme poverty. And in just 70 plus years, they've become this economic superpower. That is through central economic planning and, yes, allowing some of those private markets in. That's by um, undercutting the U.S. on labor because they don't actually have to pay people very much. They don't have to pay them based on their value so they can make people come over there and work far cheaper, have their companies there, and then we buy their products cheaper. We are propping up China's economy, and we've been really stupid with our own policies when it comes to that. And also, we are constantly hamstringing ourselves because our government keeps regulating our economy more, getting more involved, tying its hands so that they are outpacing us, plus all the money we're spending on war instead of actually like letting people keep their taxes and invest in more things. So they are playing us right now. The U.S. has been really foolish, but it's not because communism works. They were starving. Yeah, and all the stupid things the U.S. is doing, this lady just listed, are because large corporations are vying for political influence and buying our politicians, influencing our politics, so nationally we make those dumb decisions. Free market, unbridled capitalism is inherently self-defeating and inevitably collapses into corporatism without some form of trust busting, which of course we haven't seen because, again, it's just too easy to buy politicians. Well, well, let's look at exactly what they did. Let's look at them. exactly what they did when they opened up trade. They opened up special economic zones where multinational corporations could come in but they said you're only allowed to do things as long as it's in line with the party and as long as it's in line with the government's central plans. I mean, to say that China is just capitalist, full stop, or that all their I'm successes come from capitalism is, is pretty ridiculous. I'm saying that they were starving before capitalism started getting the They were starving the under feudalism. Hannah and Cam come in here with the guns. They got the fire. They know they're ready for this. Uh. <laughs> um, who is we? When you say we, who's in this we? Because we did this, because we did that. Who is this, who is this so again, metaphorical we? Because right? the U.S. government is not a capitalist government, and we have to be strict about terms here, capitalism is a system and an economy. The government can either uphold capitalism or they can impede it. Our government is constantly impeding it. So when the government comes in and tells you, you can trade with this person, you can't trade with that person, that is the government, which is we, because we have a representative government doing that. Is that something I, as a capitalist, want to see them doing? An American citizen. No, I don't. Ameri yeah, and the American government impedes capitalism at the behest of big business. What this lady has just said or insinuated here is like as delusional as people who think we can actually enter into some sort of egalitarian socialist utopia where everyone's sort of autonomous and people just 
exist in these work your worker cooperatives and everyone's self-governing like this is that ridiculous we can't return to this sort of unbridled true free market capitalism inevitably large firms influence politics to regulate other firms out of existence that's just what happens and you either have a system where big business is buying politicians and influencing politics or big government is deciding what firms are allowed to exist. What we have here between the U.S. and China is two different distinct models of corporatism vying for control on the world stage. But we are American citizens, and so they are supposed to be representing our interest. If we're going to talk about what we're doing as a country, yes, like that is a huge part of it. And I also want to go back to communism because when you talk about some of these countries that people often call democratic socialist countries, they rank higher on the economic freedom index than we do. That means Sorry. they are more capitalist yeah. in their economy than we are. And I don't think those countries we are. are socialist to be And clear. so I just want to make sure we're defining terms because communism is the centralized control and ownership of production I, I'm, I'm, of I'm companies. Sorry, but this is my <laughs> point I'm trying to make. Communism, at least according to the theory of Marx, is decentralized. One of the things that really kind of mucks up conversations like these is that uh, communism and socialism have two different meanings. People who are critics of leftist movements often conflate the two. People on the left sometimes conflate the two. People on the left have differing perspectives of how they want to achieve communism. So it just makes conversations like these a mess. So hopefully I can explain it to you right here. So in original Marxist theory, socialism is supposed to be a bridge between capitalism and communism. The Chinese government itself actually refers to itself as being in the lower stage of socialism, and then they just need to sort of accrue more funds and money max until they're actually able to achieve communism and spread globally. Marx predicted that based on the profit motive, capitalists would pay their workers poorly enough and raise the price of goods high enough that this would produce workers' revolutions. These workers would seize the means of production, overthrow the capitalist class, and establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. For a time, the state would still remain somewhat necessary to defend the revolution, regulate the economy, and provide public services, although the goal would remain to create a classless society. Eventually, after the state is presumably victorious over all other nations, it would transition from the lower stage of socialism into the upper stage of communism where people become self-governing, government is radically decentralized, and the state eventually becomes unnecessary and withers away. And the entire world is kind of run by these communes of direct democracies. Obviously a ridiculous scenario. Giving people government aid makes them lazy. Getting government aid makes you lazy. A great example of that is Elon Musk. Of course the reason he came up here is because he hates Elon. The amount of government aid the X Foundation gets in order to pursue inventions that don't work. How often did you hear about that tunnel? Elon Musk is just one example of many different CEOs, multi-corporations who get government aid to be able to do these things just because they have the net worth. Yeah, so, uh, I agree with you on this. I hate corporate welfare. I think it's the biggest perversion of capitalism out there. It doesn't work. Its track record is terrible. And it actually is the government coming in and picking winners and losers. And it very rarely goes in favor of small businesses, which is what most business in the U.S. actually is owned by. But the way it makes people lazy is not necessarily because they're bad people. It's because you have uh, fiscal cliffs. You get this amount of welfare if you make under $24,000 a year. You make $25,000 a year, your benefits drop off. So it actually disincentivizes people from moving up, working harder, taking on more jobs. And it's a terrible structure. I completely agree with that from a perspective of it creates animosity. If there was um, a system saying that you couldn't use a certain government aid program that you're already paying taxes to just because you make this amount, wouldn't you have animosity for those mm -hmm. people below you? 
the cliffs are, are, I think, more so specifically referencing like situations where people are taking in welfare and it compensates for their like lack of income, and then they get a promotion or something and they lose the welfare and they're worse off than they were before they lost the welfare and prior to the promotion. I know tons of people like that who are caught in this weird middle ground where they're like working poor, they're productive and they want to be better off, but they still don't have the resources to get there. But then they're also making too much to actually get state aid. And they're not bums, so they really do deserve the leg up. There are cases where I think people are incentivized to work less hard in order to keep their income under a certain level so they can collect a certain amount of you know, government money, which in that specific case, then, then yes, I guess it does incentivize laziness. But also, if you look at government programs like Medicare and Medicaid, they're some of the most highly approved of programs in, in the country. And when you make a welfare program universal, when you make it so it applies to everybody, it basically becomes politically invincible because nobody is going to argue for their grandma's health care to be taken away. I would, but only because I hate boomers that much. <laughs> And we have a problem in this country where 45,000 people are dying every single year because they don't have access to basic health insurance. And I think if we were to nip that in the bud and nationalize those giant pharmaceutical companies and make sure that, that health care is provided to everyone, we would actually stimulate a lot of innovation, a lot of labor, and a lot of hard work in this country because people would be less bogged down by medical bills and would be more healthy in general. So without a market, if those are, if those, the pharmaceutical industry specifically is nationalized, how does the state set prices effectively? Um, Before you get ahead. into that point, did you want to say something? Yes, please. <laughs> there you go. Deflection. But Germany's healthcare system is kind of a hybrid and is better than socialized medicine such as the UK or Canada, but then also America's healthcare system. So there is another way. Don't forget that. I was going to add, I guess like I lived in China for eight years and 10 years in the US, so I have like the divide between the two. I guess in China, generally speaking, it's really safe. Um, and there's a lot more equality in certain areas. In terms of like, uh, support from the government, it is easier to get healthcare, 100%. And also I think certain societies use communism well and it can be used well to create I guess more equality I think capitalism ultimately creates inequality so one thing I was gonna say you have to be careful there's an old saying we went out of the fire into the frying pan the question is under what system do you not get the guys at the top becoming super wealthy because Stalin and Mao Zedong Chavez these people become Chavez okay Castro this man is no angel the question becomes which one dampens our greed in a way that benefit the most think, people. Yeah, I don't even think it should be that. It should just be which system is more effective at distributing resources and helping people have and good outcomes. And China has abolished poverty and we have rampant Ch poverty. China hasn't abolished That's poverty. Yes, they have according to the World Bank. There's 300,000 homeless people, people in China. people though, in ratio. He said that he abolished poverty. I would love to ask that capitalist guy what the hell is going on in every major city on the east and west coast of America. It's a nightmare here. Yeah. China is more authoritarian, but it's also more efficient. Women are more empowered in a communist society. There's a really good book on this called Why Women Have Better You want, to, you want Bunny to go first? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was not I'm like, as a man. <laughs> And now you all know why I am not and never will be a communist or a Marxist. Because men and women are not equal and patriarchy is valuable. Only the rich benefit from capitalism. Uh, really? Nobody. Um... Only the rich benefit from capitalism. Uh, capitalism being the control of a state apparatus or a nation, government, state, whatever word you use, by a certain class. So if rich people are, those, are that class and they control that state apparatus, the government, that nation, of course they're the ones to benefit from it. Talk to the abyss. Looks like it, it seems like a TikTok. Do you guys disagree? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to explain why yeah. first before you go? Yeah, yeah, hit me, so hit I'm me. a Marxist, so I believe that society 
through class struggles, transitions through different epochs or different modes of production, or different economic systems. So I believe that the Civil War was a revolutionary war in America that transitioned us out of the slave-based mode of production in, in the antebellum South into capitalism. I believe that capitalism is a superior economic system to slavery. In Europe, I believe capitalism was, a, a, in many ways, a superior economic system to feudalism. The guy in the pink shirt is a much more theory-literate communist than the guy with the head wrap and you can tell this because he is comparing uh, capitalism to previous modes of productions or systems and saying well you know it's better than this it's it's a little bit more neutral uh, and Marx himself would probably agree Marx understood capitalism as this sort of necessary stepping stone that had to be overcome to achieve socialism and then later communism like he said, it was problematic, exploitative, and imperfect, but then also better than feudalism. But I would argue and, and agree that capitalism is better for everybody than, say, slavery. Like, you can still rise from the bottom with capitalism, and that's most societies. So it's like this possible for, you know, the less wealthy to climb to the top. If they have a good idea or, like, innovate on something that they think is a good uh, concept. We're talking about benefits, right? Uh, no, I, I see both your points. Um, definition. I oh, know. Now I'm being empathetic. I was telling you not to give you a definition. Now I'm about to give you a definition of capitalism. We should, we uh, should establish definitions of things we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, right? we got to be on the same page. <laughs> about this, I, definitions. I, I feel like when it comes to science and ideology, it just gets kind of messy. It's more. It's. I feel like it's just so much easier to do logical. Like, well, I mean, if you points, if you cite like, a definition, I'll accept whatever you give me. I don't know about these guys. My, nah, this is a trap. Hold on. Let me finish this. <laughs> but, <laughs> my idea of capitalism. Um, I very much look at it within. Again, very material. Very cemented the idea of who has control over the military, judicial, legislative arm of a nation or a state. For, for an episode about capitalist communists, we have not talked about class. Whatever class has control within that nation. And now capitalism would be the rich, the bourgeoisie, the, 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 the job creators having complete control within that society. Of course, that would only benefit rich people. Of course, you're going to get. Of course, you're going to push for tax cuts. Of course, you're never going to talk about livable wage. You'll talk about minimum wage. It's harm reduction. It's a tricky one. I'm not sure there's ever a time when wealth doesn't concentrate up, I... including Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot. It's all Castro. You don't think Castro was a rich man who was benefited from the Cuban system? Didn't he have almost a billion dollars when yeah, he died? But... This idea, this concept that this guy just mentioned about wealth concentrating at the top is best expressed by the Iron Law of Oligarchy by Robert Mitchells. Leadership inevitably becomes self-serving in some way. Those in power will prioritize their own interests and maintain their position at the expense of the organization's original goals and the interests of its members overall. Hence why every proclaimed Marxist or communist state still has a wealthy ruling class. I want to interject real fast because unlike Cam, I won't just accept definitions. So when we talk about capitalism, that's fine, that's your definition. But for most people, when we say capitalism, what we mean is the free exchange and selling and buying of goods, right? And the more you have of that, the more freedom you have in those decisions, the less the government's involved in that, the more capitalism you have. And as we have seen capitalism expand across the world over the past 30, 40, 50 years, we have seen an 80% reduction in world poverty since 1990 alone. What this lady is describing is globalism and it ultimately increases the standard of living of people in the third world at the expense of the standard of living of blue collar workers in the first world. Anyway, this video is already long enough as it is. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share it if you did. And red channels will catch you in the next one.